Chapter thirty one of The Worm Ouroboros. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jason Mills. The Worm Ouroboros by E. R. Edison. Chapter thirty one The Demons Before Carsey. How Garice the King, albeit so strong a sorcerer, elected that by the sword, and chiefly by the Lord Corund, his captain general, should be determined as for this time the event of these high matters and how those twain, the king and the lord Juss, spake face to face at last, and of the bloody battle before Carsey, and what fruit was garnered there, and what made ripe against harvest. Garice the king sat in his chamber the thirteenth morning after these tidings brought to Carsey. On the table under his hand were papers of account, and schedules of his armies and their equipment. Corrin sat at the king's right hand, and over against him Carinius. Corrin's great hairy hands were clasped before him on the table. He spoke without book, resting his gaze on the steady clouds that sailed across the square of sky seen through the high window that faced him. Of which land and the home provinces, O king, naught but good. All the companies of soldiers which were appointed to repair to this part by the tenth of the month are now come hither, save some bands of spearmen from the south, and some from Estragansia. These last I expect to-day. Vigilus writers, they come with him, with the heavy troops from Baltery I sent him to assemble. So is the muster full as for these parts, Thramne, Zorn, Permio, the land of Ar, Trace, Butney, and Estramarine. Of the subject allies, there's less good there. The kings of Minia and Gilter, Olis of Tecapan, County Escobrine of Tzusha, the king of Elian, all be here with their contingents. But there's mightier names we miss. Duke Maxdlin of Azumel, hath flung off's allegiance, and cut off your envoy's ears, O king, tis thought for some supposed light part of the sons of Corsus done to his sister. That docketh us thirty score stout fighters. The lord of Ushtland sendeth no answer, and now are we advertised by Minia and Gilter of his open malice and treason, who did stubbornly let them the way hither through his country, while they hastened to do your majesty's commands. Then there's the Ogedian levies, should be nigh a thousand spears, ten days overdue. Hemming that raiseth Pixieland in Presmira's name, will bring them in if he may, who also hath order, being on his way, to rouse Maltrini to action, from whom no word as yet, and I do fear treachery in him. Maltrini and Algidia both, they have been so long of coming. King Barsht of Terribia sendeth flat refusal. It is known to you besides, O king, said Carinius, that the king of Nevria came in last night, many days past the day appointed, and but half his just compliment. The king drew back his lips. I will not dash his spirits by blaming him at this present. Later I'll have that king's head for this. This is the sum, said Corund. Nay, then, I had forgot the red foliot with folk. Three hundred perchance came in this morning. Carinius thrust out his tongue and laughed. One hen lobster such as he shall scarce afford a course for this banquet. He keepeth faith, said Corund, where bigger men turn dastards. Tis seen now that these forced leagues be as sure as they were sealed with butter. Your Majesty will doubtless give him audience. The king was silent a while, studying his papers. What strength to-day in Carsey? he asked. Corund answered him, As near as may be, two score hundred foot and fifty score horse, five thousand in all, and, that I weigh most, O king, big, broad, strong set lads of Witchland, and nigh every jack of them. The king said, Twas not well done, O Corund, to bid thy son delay for Ogidia and Maltrini. He might else have been in Carsey now, with a thousand Pixielanders to swell our strength. I did that I did, answered Corrin, seeking only your good, O king. A few days' delay might buy us a thousand spears. Delay, said the king, hath favoured mine enemy. This we should have done. At his first landing give him no time but wink, set on him with all our forces, and throw him into the sea. If luck go with us, that may yet be, said Corrin. The king's nostrils widened. He crouched forward, glaring at Corrund and Carinius, his jaw thrust out, so that the stiff black beard on it brushed the papers on the table before him. "'The demons,' said he, "'landed in the night at Ralpa. They come on, with great journeys northward. We'll be here ere three days be spent.' Both there grew red as blood. Corrund spake, "'Who told you these tidings, O king?' "'Care not thou for that,' said the king. "'Enough for thee, I know it. Hath it ta'en you napping?' No, answered he, these ten days past we have been ready, with what strength we might make, to receive them, come there from what quarter they will. So it is, though, that while we lack the pixie land suckers, 
just hath by some odds the advantage over us, if, as our intelligence saith, six thousand fighting men do follow him, and these forced besides with some that should be ours. Thou wouldst, said the king, await these out of Pixie land, with that else Hemming may gather, afore we offer them battle. Said Corund, That would I. We must look beyond the next turn of the road, O my lord the king. That would not I, said Corinius. That is stoutly said, Corinius, said the king. Yet remember, thou hadst the greater force on Crothering's side, yet wast overborne. "'Tis that standeth in my mind, lord, said Corund, for well I know, had I been there, I'd have fared no better. The lord Corinius, whose brow had darkened with the naming of his defeat, looked cheerfully now, and said, I pray you but consider, O my lord the king, that here at home is no room for such a slight or gin as that whereby in their own country they took me, when Jus and Brandock de Haar and their stinking gabalunses do cry huff at us on which land soil, tis time to give them a choke pair, which with your leave, lord, I will promise now to do, other else to lose my life. Give me thy hand, said Corrund, of all men else would I have chosen thee for such a day as this, and, work to-day to meet the whole power of demon land in arms, to stand perdue with thee for this bloody service. But let us hear the king's commands. Which way soe'er he choose, we shall do it right gladly. Gorais the king sat silent. One lean hand rested on the iron serpent head of his chair's arm. The other, with finger outstretched against the jutting cheekbone, supported his chin. Only in the deep shadow of his eye sockets a lambent light moved. At length he started, as if the spirit, flown to some unsounded gulfs of time or space, had in that instant returned to its mortal dwelling. He gathered the papers in a heap, and tossed them to Corund. "'Too much lieth on it,' said he. "'He that hath many peas may put more in the pot. But now the day approacheth when I and Jus must cast up our account together, and one or all shall be brought to death and bane.' He stood up from his chair, and looked down on those two, his chosen captains, great men of war raised up by him to be kings over two quarters of the world. They watched him like little birds under the eye of a snake. "'The country hereabout,' said the king, "'is not good for horsemanship, and the demons be great horsemen. Corsi is strong, and never can it be forced by assault. Also under mine eye should my men of Witchland acquit themselves to do the greatest deeds. Therefore will we abide them here in Corsi, until young Hemming come and his levies out of Pixieland. Then shall ye fall upon them, and never make an end till the land be utterly purged of them, and all the lords of Demonland be slain. Corinius said, To hear is to obey, O king. However, not to dissemble with you, I'd leave her at em at once, instead of let them sit a while and refresh their army. Occasion is a wanton wench, O king, that is quick to beckon another man if one look coldly on her. Moreover, lord, could you not by your art, in small time, with certain compositions? But the king brake in upon him, saying, Thou knowest not what thou speakest. There is thy sword. There thy men. These my commands. See thou perform them punctually when time shall come. Lord, said Corinius, you shall not find me wanting. Therewith he did obeisance, and went forth from before the king. The king said unto Corund, Thou hast manned him well, this tassel gentle. There was some danger he should so mislike subjection unto thee in these acts martial, as it should breed some quarrel should little speed our enterprise. Think not you that, O king, answered Corund. Tis grown like an almanac for the past year, past date. I will feed out of my hand now. Because thou hast carried it with him, said the king, in so honourable and open plainness. Hold on the road thou hast begun, and be mindful still that into thine hand is given the sword of Witchland and therein have I put my trust for this great hour. Corund looked upon the king with grey and quick eyes, shining like unto the eagles. He slapped his heavy sword with the flat of his hand. "'Tis a tough fox, O my lord the king, will not fail his master. Therewith, glad at the king's gracious words, he did obeisance unto the king, and went forth from the chamber. The same night there appeared in the sky, impending over Carsey, a blazing star with two bushes. Corund beheld it in an open space betwixt the clouds, as he went to his chamber. He said naught of it to his lady wife, lest it should trouble her. But she too had from her window seen that star, yet spake not of it to her lord for a like reason. And King Garice, sitting in his chamber with his baleful books, beheld that star and its fiery streamers, which the king rather noted than liked. For albeit he might not know of a certain what way that sign intended, Yet was it apparent to one so deeply learned in negromancy and secrets astronomical that this thing was fatal, being of those prodigies and ominous prognostics which forerun the tragical ends of noble persons and the ruins of states. 
The third day following, watchmen beheld from Carsey Walls in the pale morning the armies of the demons that filled the whole plain to southward. But of the suckers out of Pixieland was as yet no sign at all. Garice the king, according as he had determined, held all his power quiet within the fortress. But for passing of the time, and because it pleased his mind to speak yet face to face with the Lord Juss, before this last mortal trial in arms should be begun betwixt them, the king sent Cadarus as his herald, with flags of truce and olive branches, into the demons' lines. By which mission it was concluded that the demons should withdraw their armies three bow-shots from the walls, and they of which land should abide all within the hold, only the king, with fourteen of his folk, unarmed, and just with a like number unarmed, should come forth into the midst of the baitable ground, and there speak together. And this meeting must be at the third hour after noon. So either party came to this parley at the hour appointed. Just went bareheaded, but, save for that, all armed in his shining burnet, with gorget and shoulder-plates demasked and embossed with wires of gold, and golden leg-harness, and rings of red gold upon his wrists. His kirtle was of wine-dark silken tissue, and he wore that dusty cloak the sylphs had made for him, the collar whereof was stiff with broidery, and strange beasts worked thereon in silver thread. According to the compact he bare no weapon only in his hand a short ivory staff inlaid with precious stones, and the head of it a ball of that stone which men call Bellus Eye, that is white, and hath within it a black apple, the midst whereof a man shall see to glitter like gold. Very masterful and proud he stood before the king, carrying his head like a stag that sniffs the morning. His brethren and Brandok de Haar remained a pace or two behind him, with King Gaslark and the lords Zig and Gro, and Melchar and Thormrod and Sturkmere, Quas with his two sons, and Astar and Bremery of Shores, goodly men and lordly to look on, unweaponed all, and wondrous was the sparkle of their jewels that were on them. Over against them, attending on the king, were these, Corund, king of Impland, and Carinius, called king of Demonland, Hakmon and Viglas, Corund's sons, Duke Corsus and his sons, Decalogus and Gorias, Ulian, king of Minia, Aulis, lord of Tecapan, Duke Arvel of Estragansia, the Red Foliot, Erp the king of Elian, and the counts of Thramne and Zusha, unweaponed but armoured to the throat, big men and strong, the most of them, and of lordly bearing, yet none to match with Carinius and Corund. The king in his mantle of cobra skins, his staff royal in his hand, topped by half a head all those tall men about him, friend and foe alike. Lean and black he towered amongst them, like a thunder-blasted pine-tree seen against the sunset. So in the golden autumn afternoon, in the midst of that sad main of sedgelands, where between slimy banks the weed-choked Druima deviously winds toward the sea, where those two men met together, for whose ambition and their pride the world was too little a place to contain them both, and peace lying between them. And like some drowsy dragon of the elder slime, squat, sinister, and monstrous, the citadel of Carsey slept over all. By and by the king spake, and said, I sent for thee because I think it good I and thou should talk together while well, yet is time for talking. Juss answered, I quarrel not with that, O king. Thou, said the king, bending his brow upon him, art a man wise and fearless. I counsel thee, and all these that be with thee, turn back from Carsey. Well, I see the blood thou didst drink in Melikavkaz will not allay thy thirst, and war is to thee thy pearl and thy paramour. Yet, if it be, turn back from Carsey. Thou standest now on the pinnacle of thine ambition, Wilt leap higher, thou fallst in the abyss. Let the four corners of the earth be shaken with our wars, but not this centre. For here shall no man gather fruit, but and if it be death he gather. Or if, then this fruit only, that zoacum, that fruit of bitterness, which when he shall have tasted of, all the bright lights of heaven shall become as darkness, and all earth's goodness as ashes in his mouth, all his life's days until he die. He paused. The Lord just stood still quailing not at all beneath that dreadful gaze. His company behind him stirred and whispered. Lord Brandock de Haar, with mockery in his eye, said somewhat to Goldry Blusco under his breath. But the king spake again to the Lord Juss, Be not deceived. These things I say unto thee, not as labouring to scare you from your set purpose with frights and fairy babes. I know your quality too well. But I have read signs in heaven, naught clear but threatful unto both you and me. For thy good I say it, O Juss, and again, for that our last speech leaveth the firmest print, be advised. Turn back from Carsey, or it be too late. Lord just hearkened attentively to the words of Garice the king, and when he had ended, answered, and said, 
O king, thou hast given us terrible good counsel. But it was riddle-wise, and hearing thee, mine eye was still on the crown thou wearest, made in the figure of a crab-fish, which because it looks one way and goes another, methought did fitly pattern out thy looking to our perils, but seeking the while thine own advantage. The king gave him an ill look, saying, I am thy lord paramount. With subjects it sits not to use this familiar style unto their king. Jos answered, Thou dost thee and thou me, and indeed it were folly in either of us twain to bend knee to t'other, when the lordship of all the earth waiteth on the victor in our great contention. Thou hast been open with me, witchland, to let me know thou art uneager to strike a field with us. I will be open too, and I will make an offer unto thee, and this it is, that we will depart out of thy country, and do no more unpeaceful deeds against thee, till thou provoke us again, and thou of thy part, of all the land of Demonland, shalt give up thy quarrel, and of Pixieland and Impland beside, and shalt yield me up Corsus and Carinius thy servants, that I may punish them for the beastly deeds they did in our land, when as we were not there to guard it. He ceased, and for a minute they beheld each other in silence. Then the king lifted up his chin and smiled a dreadful smile. Carinius whispered mockingly in his ear, Lord, you may lightly give him Corsus. That were easy composition, and false coin too, methinks. Stand back i' thy place, said the king, and hold thy peace. And unto Lord Jus he said, Of all ensuing harm the cause is in thee. For I am now resolved never to put up my sword, until of thy bleeding head I may make a football. And now let the earth be afraid, and Cynthia obscure her shine. No more words but mum. Thunder and blood and night must usurp our parts to complete and make up the catastrophe of this great peace. That night the king walked late in his chamber in the Iron Tower alone. These three years past he had seldom resorted thither, and then commonly but to bear away some or other of his books to study in his own lodging. His jars and flasks and bottles of blue and green and purple glass, wherein he kept his cursed drugs and electuaries of secret composition, his athols and athanors, his crucibles, his horse-bellied retorts and alembics and bans maries stood a row on shelves, coated with dust, and hung about with the dull spider's weavings. The furnace was cold. The glass of the windows was clouded with dirt. The walls were mildewed. The air of the chamber fusty and stagnant. The king was deep in his contemplation, with a big black book open before him on the six-sided reading-stand. The damnablest of all his books, the same which had taught him aforetime what he must do, when by the wicked power of enchantment he had wanted but a little, to have confounded Demonland, and all the lords thereof in death and ruin. The open page under his hand was of parchment discoloured with age, and the writing on the page was in characters of ancient out-of-fashion crabbedness, heavy and black, and the great initial letters and the illuminated borders were painted and gilded in dark and fiery hues, with representations of dreadful faces, and forms of serpents, and toad-faced men, and apes and manticores, and succubi and incubi, and obscene representations, and figures of unlawful meaning. These were the words of the writing on the page, which the king conned over and over, falling again into a deep study between whiles, and then conning these words again, of an age-old prophetic writing, touching the preordinate destinies of the royal house of Garais in Corsi. So shall your house stand and be, unto eternity. Yet walk warily, witting full certainly, that if impiously, the second time in the body, practising grammarie, one of ye catched shall be, by the fiendish subtlety, and his life loss it be, broke is then this seary, damned are you then eternally, yet shouldest thou then never more see, scarcely the gods mought rescue ye, out of the hell where you will lee, unto eternity, the stairs to hell it me. Garas the king stood up and went to the south window. The casement bolts were rusted. He forced them, and they flew back with a shriek and a clatter and a thin shower of dust and grit. He opened the window and looked out. The heavy night grew to her depth of quiet. There were lights far out in the marshes, the lights of Lord Juss's campfire of his armies gathered against Carsey. Scarcely without a chill might a man have looked upon that king standing by the window, for there was in the tall lean frame of him an iron aspect, as of no natural flesh and blood, but some harder, colder element and his countenance, like the picture of some dark divinity graven ages ago by men long dead, bore the imprint of those old qualities of unrelenting power, scorn, violence, and oppression, ancient as night herself, yet untouched by age, young as each night when it shuts down, 
and old and elemental as the primeval dark. A long while he stood there, then came again to his book. Garice Seventh, he said in himself. That was once in the body, and I have done better than that, but not yet well enough. Tis too hazardous the second time, alone. Corund is a man undaunted in war, but the man is too superstitious, and quaketh at that which hath not flesh and blood. Apparitions and urchin shows can quite unman him. There's Corinius, careth not for God or man a point, but he is too rash and unadvised. I were mad to trust him in it. Were the goblin here it might be carried. Damnable both sides villain, he's cast off from me. He scanned the page as if his piercing eyes would thrust beyond the barriers of time and death, and discover some new meaning in the words, which should agree better with the thing his mind desired, while his judgment forbade it. He says, Damned eternally. He says, That breaketh the series, and earth shouldst thou then never more see. Put him by. And the king slowly shut up his book, and locked it with three padlocks, and put back the key in his bosom. The need is not yet, he said. The sword shall have his day, and Corund. But if that fail me, then even this shall not turn me back, but I will do that I will do. In the same hour, when the king was but now entered again into his own lodgings, came through a runner of Hemmings, to let them know that he, fifteen hundred strong, marched down the way of kings from Pixieland. Moreover, they were advertised that the demon fleet lay in the river that night, and it was not unlike the attack should be in the morning, by land and water. All night the king sat in his chamber, holding counsel with his generals, and ordering all things for the morrow. All night long he closed not his eyes an instant, but the others he made sleep by turns, because they should be brisk and ready for the battle. For this was their counsel, to draw out their whole army on the left bank before the bridge-gate, and there offer battle to the demons at point of day. For if they should abide within doors, and suffer the demons to cut young Hemming off from the bridge-gate, then were he lost. And if the bridge-house should fall, and the bridge, then might the demons lightly ship what force they pleased to the right bank, and so closely invest them in Carsey. Of an attack on the right bank they had no fear, well knowing themselves able to sit within doors and laugh at them, since the walls there were inexpugnable. But if a battle were now brought about before the bridge-gate as they were minded, and Hemming should join in the fight from the eastward, there was good hope that they should be able to crumple up the battle of the demons, driving them in upon their centre from the west, whilst Hemming smote them on the other part, whereby these should be cast into a great rout and confusion, and not able to escape away to their ships, but there in the fenlands before Carsey should be made a prey unto the witches. When it was the cold last hour before the dawn, the generals took from the king their latest commands, ere they drew forth their armies. Corinius came forth first from the king's chamber, a little while before the rest. In the draughty corridor the lamps swung and smoked, making an uncertain windy light. Corinius espied by the stairhead the Lady Sreva standing, whether watching to bid her father adieu, or but following idle curiosity. Whichever it were, not a fico gave he for that, but coming swiftly upon her whisked her aside into an alcove, where the light was barely enough to let him see the pale shimmer of her silken gown, dark hair pinned loosely up in deep snaky coils, and dark eyes shining. "'My witty false one, have I caught thee? Nay, fight not. Thy breath smells like cinnamon. Kiss me, Sreva. "'I'll not,' said she, striving to escape. "'Naughty man, am I used thus?' But finding she got naught by struggling, she said in a low voice, "'Well, if thou bring back demon-land to-night, then let's hold more chat.' Hearken to the naughty traitress, said he, that but last night did didst do me some uncivil discourtesies, and now speaketh me fair. And what a devil for, if not cause her seemeth I'll likely not come back after this day's fight. But I'll come back, mistress kiss and be gone. Ay, by the gods, and I'll have my payment too. His lips fed deep on her lips. His strong and greedy hands softly mastered her against her will, till, with a little smothered cry, she embraced him, bruising her tender body against the armour he was girt withal. Between the kisses she whispered, "'Yes, yes, to-night!' Surely he damned spiteful fortune that sent him not this encounter by an half-hour sooner. When he was departed, Sreva remained in the shadow of the alcove to set in order her hair and apparel, not a little disarrayed in that hot wooing, out of which darkness she had convenience to observe the leave-taking of Presmira and her lord, as they came down that windy corridor and paused at the head of the stairs. Presmira had her arm in his, "'I know where the devil keepeth his tail, madam,' said Corund, "'and I know a very traitor when I see him.' "'When didst thou ever yet fare ill by following of my counsel, my lord?' said Presmira. 
or did I refuse thee ever anything thou didst require me of? These seven years since I put off my maiden's own for thee, and twenty kings sought me in sweet marriage, but thee I preferred before them all, seeing the falcon shall not mate with poppingers, nor the she-eagle with swans and bustards. And will you say nay to me in this? She stood round to face him. The pupils of her great eyes were large in the doubtful lamplight, swallowing their green fires in deep pools of mystery and darkness. The rich and gorgeous ornaments of her crown and girdle seemed but a poor casket for that matchless beauty which was hers. Her face, where every noble and sweet quality and everything desirable of earth or heaven had framed each feature to itself, the glory of her hair like the red sun's glory, her whole body's poise and posture like a stately bird's new-lighted after flight. "'Though it be very rhubarb to me,' said Corin, "'shall I say nay to thee this tide? "'Not this tide, my queen.' "'Thanks, dear my lord. "'Disarm him and bring him in, if you may. "'The king shall not refuse us this to pardon his folly, "'when thou shalt have obtained this victory for him upon our enemies.' "'The Lady Sreva might hear no more, "'hearkened she never so curiously. "'But when they were now come to the stair-foot, "'Corrand paused a minute to try the buckles of his harness. "'His brow was clouded. "'At length he spake, this shall be a battle mortal fierce, and doubtous for both parties. Against such mighty opposites as here we have, tis possible. No more. But kiss me, dear lass. And if— Tushed will not be. And yet I'd not leave it unsaid. If ill tide ill, I'd not have thee waste all thy days a-grieving. Thou knowest I am not one of your sour envious jacks, bear so poor a conceit of themselves they begrudge their wives should wed again, lest the next husband should prove the better man. But Presmira came near to him with good and merry countenance. Let me stop thy mouth, my lord. These be foolish thoughts for a great king going into battle. Come back in triumph, and in the mean season think on me that wait for thee, as a star waits, dear my lord, and never doubt the issue. The issue, answered he, I'll tell thee when tis done. I'm no astronomer. I'll hew with my sword, love. Spoil some of their guesses if I may. Good fortune and my love go with thee, she said. Sreva, coming forth from her hiding, hastened to her mother's lodging, and there found her that had just bid adieu to her two sons, her face all blubbered with tears. In the same instant came the duke her husband to change his sword, and the ladies in Ambria caught him about the neck and would have kissed him. But he shook her off, crying out that he was weary of her and her slobbering mouth, menacing her besides with filthy imprecations, that he would drag her with him and cast her to the demons, who, since they had a strong loathing for such ugly tits and stale old trots, would no doubt hang her up, or disembowel her, and so rid him of his lasting consumption. Therewith he went forth hastily. But his wife and daughter, either weeping upon other, came down into the court, meaning to go up to the tower above the water-gate, to see the army marshalled beyond the river. And on the way Sreva related all she had heard said betwixt Corrand and Presmira. In the court they met with Presmira's self, and she going with blithe countenance and light tread, and humming a merry tune, bade them good morrow. "'You can bear these things more bravelier than we, madam,' said Zenambria. "'We be too gentle-hearted, methinks, and pitiful.' Presmira replied upon her, "'Tis true, madam, I have not the weak sense of some of you soft-eyed, whimpering ladies, and by your leave I'll keep my tears, which be great spoilers of the cheeks beside, until I need them.' When they were passed by, "'Is it not a stony-livered and a shameless hussy, O oh, my mother?' said Sreva. "'And is it not scandalous, her laughing and jestings?' as I have told it thee, when she did bid him adieu, devising only how best she might coax him to save the life of yonder chambering traitorous hound. With whom, said Zenambria, she want to do the thing, I'd think shame to speak on. Truly this foreign madam with her loose and wanton ways doth scandal the whole land for us. But Presmira went her way, glad that she had not by an eyelid's flicker let her lord guess what a dread possessed her mind, who had in all the bitter night seen strange and cruel visions, portending loss and ruin of all she held dear. Now, when dawn appeared, was the king's whole army drawn out in battle array before the bridge-house. Corinius held command on the left. There followed him fifteen hundred chosen troops of Witchland, with the dukes of Trace and Estragansia, besides these kings and princes with their outlandish levies, the king of Minia, Count Escobrine of Tsusha, and the Red Foliot. Corsus led the centre, and with him went King Erp of Elian, and his green-coated Slinkasters, the king of Nevria, Axtacus, lord of Permio, the king of Gilta, Aulis of Tecapan, and other captains, seventeen hundred men in all. The right the Lord Corrand had chosen for himself. Two thousand Witchland troops, the likeliest and best, 
hardened to war in Impland and Demonland and the southeastern borders, followed his standard, beside the heavy spearmen of Baltery and swordsmen of Butney and Ar. Viglas's son was there, and the Count of Thramne, Cadarus, Diderus of Largos, and the Lord of Estramarine. But when the demons were aware of that great army standing before the bridge-gate, they put themselves in array for battle, and their ships made ready to move up the river under Carsey, if by any means they might attack the bridge by water, and so cut off for the witches their way of retreat. It was bright low sunshine, and the splendour of the jewelled army of the demons, and their many-coloured kirtles, and the plumes that were in their helms, was a wonder to behold. This was the order of their battle. On their left, nearest the river, was a great company of horse, and the Lord Brandock de Hart to lead them on a great golden dun with fiery eyes. His island men, Melchor and Thormrod, with Camerar of Stropardon, and Sturkmere and Stipmar, were the chief captains that rode with him to that battle. Next to these came the heavy troops from the east, and the Lord Juss himself their leader, on a tall, fierce, big-boned chestnut. About him was his picked bodyguard of horse, with Bremery of Shaws their captain, and in his battle were these chiefs besides, Astar of Retre, and Gizmor Gleam of Justdale, and Peridor of Sewell. Lord Spitfire led the centre, and with him Fendor of Shalgroth, and Emeron, and the men of Dolny, great spearmen, also the Duke of Azumel, sometime allied with Witchland. There went also with him the Lord Gro, that scanned still those ancient walls with a heavy heart, thinking on that great king within, and with what mastery of intellect and will he ruled those dark, turbulent, and bloody men who bear sway under him, thinking on Queen Presmira. To his sick imagining, the blackness of Carsey, which no bright morning light might lighten, seemed not, as of old, the image and emblem of the royal house of Witchland, and their high magnificency and power on earth, but rather the shadow thrown before of destiny and death, ready to put down that power for ever. Which, whether it should so befall or no, he did not greatly care, being aweary of life and life's fevers, wild longings, and exorbitant effects, whereof he thought he had now learned much, that to him, who as it seemed must still adhere to his own foes, abandoning the other's service, fortune through whatever chop could bring no peace at last. On the demon right, the Lord Goldry Blusco streamed his standard, leading to battle the South Firthers and the heavy spearmen of Mardidale and Throwwater. With him was King Gaslock and his army of Goblinland, and levies from Ogedia and Ushtlan, lately revolted from their allegiance to King Arise. The Lord Zig, with his light horse of Ramerick and Kellyaland and the Northern Dales, covered their flank to the eastward. Gorais the king beheld these dispositions from his tower above the water-gate. He beheld, besides, a thing the demons might not see from below, for a little swelling of the ground that cut off their view, the marching of men far away along the way of kings from the eastward, young Hemming with the vassalry of Pixieland and Maltrini. He sent a trusty man to apprise Corrond of it. Now Lord Just let blow up the battle-call, and with the loud braying of the trumpets the hosts of the demons swung forth to battle, and the clash of those armies, when they met before Carsey, was like the bursting of a thunder-cloud. But like a great sea-cliff, patient for ages under the storm-wind's furies, that not one night's loud wind and charging breakers can wear away, nor yet a thousand thousand nights, the embattled strength of Witchland met their onset, mixed with them, flung them back, and stood unremoved. Coram's iron battalions bear in this first brunt the heaviest load, and bear it through. For the ships, with young Hesper Golthring in command most fiercely urging them, ran up the river to force the bridge, and Corund, whilst he met on his front the onset of the flower of Demonland, must still be shot at by these behind. Hackmon and Viglas, those young princes' sons, were charged with the warding of the bridge and walls, to burn and break up their ships, and they of all hands bestirring them twice and thrice threw back the demons when they had gotten a footing on the bridge, until, in fine, both sides for a long space fighting very cruelly, it fell out very fatally against Hesper and his power, his ships all lighted in a law, and the more part of his folk burned or drowned or slain with the sword, and himself, after many and grievous wounds in his last attempt, left alone on the bridge, and crawling to have got away was stabbed in with a dagger and died. After this the ships fell back down the river, so many as might avail thereto, and those sons of Corund, their task manfully fulfilled, came forth with their folk to join in the main battle, and the smoke of the burning ships was like incense in the nostrils of the king, watching these things from his tower above the water-gate. Little pause was there betwixt this first brunt and the next, for Hemming now bare down from the east, drove in Zig's horsemen that were hampered in the heavy ground, and pressed his onset home on the demon right. Along the whole line from Corrond's post beside the river, to the eastern flank where Hemming joined Corinius, the witches now set on most fiercely, 
and now with the odds of numbers, which were at first against them, swung mightily in their favour, and under this great side-blow on his flank not all the Lord Goldry Blusco's soldiership, nor all the terror of his might in arms, could uphold the demon's battle-line. Yard by yard they fell back before the witches, most gloriously maintaining their array unbroken, though the outland allies broke and fled. Meantime on the demon left, Juss and Brandock de Haar most stubbornly withstood that onslaught, albeit they had to do with the first and chosen troops of Witchland in which struggle befell the most bloody fighting that was yet seen that day, and the stour of battle so asper and so mortal that it was hard to see how any man should come out from it with life, since not a man of either side would budge an inch, but die there in his steps if he might not rather slay the foe before him. So the armies swayed for an hour, like wrestlers locked, but in the end the Lord Corrund had his way, and held his ground before the bridge-gate. Romanod of Dolney, galloping to Lord Juss where he paused a while, panting from violence of the battle, brought him by Spitfire's command tidings from the right, telling him Goldry's self could hold no longer against such odds, that the centre yet held, but at the next onset was like to break, or the right winger else be driven in upon their rear and all overwhelmed. If your highness cannot throw back Corund, all is lost. In these short minutes lull, if lull it were, when all the time the battle like a sounding sea rolled on with a ceaseless noise of riding and slaying and the clang of arms, just chose. Demon land and the whole world's destinies hung on his choice. He had no counsellor. He had no time for slow deliberation. In such a moment, imagination, resolution, swift decision, all high gifts of nature, are naught. Swift horses gulfed and lost in the pit which fate the enemy digged in the way before them. Except painful knowledge, stored up patiently through years of practice, shall have prepared a road sure and clean for their flying hooves to bear them in the great hour of destiny. So it was from the beginning with all great captains, so with the Lord Juss in that hour, when ruin swooped upon his armies. For two minutes' space he stood silent, then sent Bremery of Shaw's galloping westward, like one minded to break his neck, with his orders to Lord Brandock de Haar, and Romanoid eastward again to Spitfire. And Juss himself, riding forward among his soldiers, shouted among them in a voice that was like a trumpet thundering, that they should now make ready for the fiercest trial of all. "'Is my cousin mad?' said Lord Brandock de Haar, when he saw and understood the whole substance and matter of it. "'Or hath he found Corrin so tame to deal with, he can make shift without me, and well nigh half his strength, and yet withstand him?' "'He looseth this hold,' answered Bremery, "'to snatch at safety. "'Tis desperate, but all other ways we but wait on destruction. "'Our right is clean driven in. "'The left holdeth but hardly. "'He chargeth your highness, break their centre, if you may. "'They have somewhat dangerously advanced their left.' and therein is their momentary peril, if we be swift enough. But remember that here, or this side, is their greatest power before us, and if we be whelmed ere you can compass it. No more but yes, said Lord Brandock de Haar. Time gallopeth. So must we. Even so in that hour when Goldry and Zig, giving way step by step before superior odds, were bent back well nigh with their backs to the river, and Corund on the demon's left had, after a bitter battle, checked and held them, and threatened now to complete in one more great blow the ruin of them all, just choosing a desperate expedient to meet a danger that else must destroy him, weakened his hard-pressed left, to throw Brandock de Haar and well-nigh eight hundred horse into Spitfire's battle, to drive a wedge betwixt Corsus and Corinius. It was now long past noon. The tempest of battle that had quietened a while for utter weariness roared forth anew from wing to wing, as Brandock de Haar hurled his horsemen upon Corsus and the subject allies, while all along the battle-line the demons rallied to fling back the enemy. For a breathless while the issue hung in suspense. Then the men of Gilter and Nevria broke and fled. Brandock de Haar and his cavalry swept through the gap, wheeled right and left, and took Corsus and Corinius in flank and rear. There fell in this onset Axtacus, lord of Permio, the kings of Elian and Gilter, Gorias the son of Corsus, the count of Tsusha, and many other noblemen and men of Mark. Of the demons many were hurt, and many slain, but none of great note save Camaror of Strapardon, whose head Corinius swapped off clean with a blow of his battle-axe, and Trentmore, whom Corsus smote full in the stomach with a javelin, so that he fell down from his horse and was dead at once. Now was all the left and centre of the witch's battle thrown into great confusion, and the allies most of all fallen into disorder, and fain to yield themselves and pray for mercy. The king, seeing the extent of this disaster, sent a galloper to Corund, who straightway sent to Corsus and Corinius, commanding them get them at their speediest with all their folk back into Corsi, while time yet served. Himself in the meantime, 
showing now, like the sun, his greatest countenance in his lowest estate, set on with his weary army to stem the advance of Jus, who now momentally gathered fresh force against him, and to keep open for the rest of the king's forces their way by the bridge-gate into Carsey. Carinius, when he understood it, galloped thither with a band of men to aid Corund, and this did likewise Hemming and Decalagus, and other captains of the witches. But Corsus himself, counting the day lost, and considering that he was an old man, and had fought now long enough, gat him privily back into Carsey as quickly as he was able, and truly he was bleeding from many wounds. By this great stand of Corund and his men was time won for a great part of the residue of the army to escape into Carsey. And ever the witches were put aback, and lost much ground, yet ever the Lord Corund, by his great valiance and noble heart, recomforted his folk, so that they gave back very slowly, most bloodily disputing the ground foot by foot to the bridge-gate, that they also might win in again, so many as might. Just said, This is the greatest deed of arms that ever I in the days of my life did see, and I have so great an admiration and wonder in my heart for Corund, that almost I would give him peace, but I have sworn now to have no peace with Witchland. Lord Grow was in that battle with the demons. He ran Diderus through the neck with his sword, so that he fell down and was dead. Corund, when he saw it, heaved up his axe, but changed his intention in the manage, saying, O landskip of iniquity, shalt thou kill beside me the men of mine household? But my friendship sitteth not on a weather vane. Live, and be a traitor. But Grow, being mightily moved with these words, and staring at great Corund wide-eyed like a man roused from a dream, answered, Have I done amiss? Tis easily remedied. Therewith he turned about, and slew a man of demon-land. Which, spitfire-seeing, he cried out upon Gro in a great rage for a most filthy traitor, and bloodily rushing in, thrust him through the buckler into the brain. In such wise, and by such a sudden vengeance, did the Lord Gro most miserably end his life days. Who, being a philosopher, and a man of peace, careless of particular things of earth, had followed and observed all his days steadfastly one heavenly star. Yet now in the bloody battle before Carsey died in the common opinion of men a manifold perjured traitor that had at length gotten the guerdon of his guile. Now came the Lord Juss with a great rout of men armed on his great horse, with his sword dripping with blood, and the battle sprang up into yet more noise and fury, and great man-slaying befell and many able men of Witchland fell in that stour, and the demons had almost put them from the bridge-gate. But the Lord Corund, rallying his folk, swung back yet again the battle-tide, albeit he was by a great odds outnumbered, and he sought none but just himself in that deadly melee, who, when he saw him coming, he refused him not, but made against him most fiercely, and with great clanging blows they swapped together a while, until Corund hewed Juss's shield asunder, and struck him from his horse. Juss, leaping up again, thrust up at Corund with his sword, and with the violence of the blow brake through the rings of his burney about his middle, and drave the sword into his breast. And Corund felt him to earth with a great downstroke on the helm, so that he lay senseless. Still the battle raged before the bridge-gate, and great wounds were given and taken of either side. But now the sons of Corund saw that their father had lost much of his blood, and waxed feeble, and the residue of his folk seeing it too, and seeing themselves so few against so many, began to be abashed. So those sons of Corund, riding up to him on either side with a band of men, made him turn back with them, and go with them in by the gate to Carsey, the which he did like a man amazed, and knowing not what he doeth. And indeed it was a great marvel how so great a lord, wounded to the death, might sit on horseback. In the great court he was gotten down from his horse. The Lady Presmira, when she perceived that his harness was all red with blood, and saw his wound, fell not down in a swoon as another might but took his arm about her shoulder, and so supported, with her stepsons to help her, that great frame which could no more support itself, yet had till that hour borne up against the whole world's strength in arms. Leeches came that she had called for, and a litter, and they brought him to the banquet hall. But after no long while those learned men confessed his hurt was deadly, and all their cunning naught. Whereupon, much disdaining to die in bed, not in the field fighting with his enemies, the Lord Corrund caused himself, completely armed and weaponed, with the stains and dust of the battle yet upon him, to be set in his chair, there to await death. Hemming, when this was done, came to tell it to the king, where from the tower above the water-gate he beheld the end of this battle. The demons held the bridge-house. The fight was done. 
The king sat in his chair looking down to the battlefield. His dark mantle was about his shoulders. He leaned forward, resting his chin in his hand. They of his bodyguard, nine or ten, stood huddled together some yards away, as if afraid to approach him. As Hemming came near, the king turned his head slowly to look at him. The low sun, swinging blood-red over Tenemos, shone full on the king's face. And as Hemming looked in the face of the king, fear got hold upon him, so that he durst not speak a word to the king, but made obeisance and departed again, trembling like one who has seen a sight beyond the veil. End of chapter 31